Good day, everyone. Welcome to ANRW. Um, we are about to start within a minute or so. Uh, I, I would like to welcome you on behalf of uh, Miria and myself. Um, we will start at exactly now, exactly, because my clock says it's um, 11 UTC. Um, we will kick off with a couple of slides from us as chairs um to welcome you to the workshop uh, and then uh, we'll start the first uh, uh presentation so welcome everyone um this is uh, uh the applied networking research workshop in case you hadn't noticed 2020 uh my co-chair miria is also uh online i hope you can see her video she's waving um, say hello everybody <laughs> say hello better um so we would like to start off by expressing our thanks uh, to the uh, program committee uh, who did all the hard work of reviewing the papers. They're shown here on the slide. They're also up on the website. So a big thank you to all of them for reviewing the, the papers that were submitted to the workshop. Um, we would also like to thank our sponsors, Akamai and Comcast, uh, who helped support the workshop uh, and uh, have the necessary funding also for the online meeting. Um, and that was really great. Uh, and I believe they also supported some of the fee waivers for some of the uh, participants. Um, some logistics for you, in case you would like to uh, have a sort of second screen to chat with other participants uh, or to talk to the speakers later on. Uh, we have a Slack channel on the SICCOM workspace. So if you, uh, and anybody can join, you don't have to be a SICCOM member to join that. Uh, the link is up on the slide here. The slides are also in the ITF data tracker uh, and uh, on the ANRW website. Um, the program and the papers for uh, uh, this session and all of the other sessions are also up on the website. And ACM has enabled access to the papers in the digital library uh, today. Um, one important note is that all sessions are being recorded and the recordings will be made available on YouTube after the workshop. So in case you are participating in the Q&A, please note that your uh, voice may be recorded. And if you decide to share your video, that will be recorded as well. Um, and like I said, the slides are in the uh, data tracker. Uh, a couple of notes on Meet Echo. Uh, I guess the IA, IETF 108 participants are familiar with that by now, but people that are joining specifically for the workshop, you may want to know that we work with a queuing system for the question and answer after each presentation. Uh, and you can click on uh, the, uh, the microphone icon with the hand to join the Q&A queue. Uh, and the session chair, so that will either be Miria or myself, uh, will then uh, give you access uh, to the microphone to ask your question. Um, there is more information on the use of Meet Echo uh, on the URL shown on the slide. And again, the slides are in the data tracker. Um, a quick overview of our program today and tomorrow. So we have three sessions today. Uh, this is the first session on DNS and BGP. Uh, then starting from uh, one o'clock UTC, uh, we will have protocol testing and validation. From 10 past 2 UTC, we will have transport protocols and traffic engineering. And tomorrow from 1 o'clock UTC, we will have the final session, which is on monitoring and logging. Um, these are the papers that will be in uh, today's session. So they are uh, enabling privacy-aware zone exchanges, inferring deployment of inbound source address validation, limiting the power of RPK authorities, withdrawal symptoms, and toward program or interdomain uh, routing. Um, and uh, let me see. Oh, those are the other sessions. So I'm not going to show those. Um, and with that, uh, I think we are ready for our first presentation. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, Alessandro from uh, Meet Echo if he can start sharing the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Nikos Kostopoulos. I'm a PhD student at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece, and I will present to you my paper with title Enabling Privacy-Aware Zone Exchanges Among Authoritative and Recursive DNS Servers. 
Our paper is motivated from DDoS attacks targeting the DNS infrastructure, and specifically the DNS water torture attack. In this attack vector, a huge number of DNS requests is forwarded towards a victim authoritative DNS server in order to exhaust its computational resources. Requests are relayed via various intermediary recursive DNS servers. These servers could either be local recursive DNS servers or open resolvers. The special characteristic of the DNS water torture attack is that DNS requests are crafted in a random manner. The attacker ensures that the FQDN included in the question section of this request is invalid, that is, not included in the zones of the authoritative DNS server. Thus, a name is never repeated. This enables the attacker to bypass the DNS caches of the intermediary recursive DNS servers and forward all of the attack traffic to the victim. As a collateral damage, the performance of recursive DNS servers is also degraded. DDoS attacks are typically mitigated more efficiently, close to their origins. In our DNS use case, this could happen in scrubbing services or appropriately deployed filters on the recursive DNS servers. To that end, a list of the valid names included in the authoritative DNS server zones should be exchanged. However, AXFR requests are typically restricted for security reasons. In this paper, we contribute with a privacy-aware schema for the efficient distribution of authoritative DNS server zone contents to request DNS servers or scrubbing infrastructures. We impose the following design requirements for our schema. Firstly, the desired system should map the authoritative DNS server zone names not in their actual form, but hashed. Thus, recursive DNS servers or scrubbing services could retrieve a complete list of the valid FQDNs without inferring the zone contents. Secondly, efficient zone mapping. We require a data structure appropriate for the compact storage of hashed FQDNs within the authoritative DNS server, low latency filtering of malicious DNS requests in the recursive DNS servers, and conserving bandwidth when information is exchanged between authoritative and recursive DNS servers. Thirdly, compatibility with the existing DNS infrastructure, i.e. a solution requiring minor software modifications on the authoritative DNS server. Copies of the hashed zones should be obtained using widely adopted types of DNS requests, for example, AXFR and AXFR. Finally, support for incremental updates. The selected data structure should support flexible element updates. In order to fulfill these requirements, we rely on probabilistic data structures as data stores for the valid names of the authoritative DNS zones. This paper extends our previous work that was presented in IEEE CloudNet the previous year. In that work, we demonstrated that Bloom filters may be used to map the names of large DNS zones efficiently in terms of time and space and filter suspicious traffic in cloud infrastructures. However, we didn't provide an information distribution mechanism. In this paper, we implement the zone exchanging schema, and we opt for Cuckoo filters, evolved versions of Bloom filters, that support item deletion and thus incremental updates. Next, I will provide background related to Bloom filters. Bloom filters are arrays of M bits that are used for approximate membership lookups. They respond to the question, is element X stored in the Bloom filter? Initially, all bits are set to zero. If I want to insert an element in the Bloom filter, I has it with k different hash functions. Corresponding positions, that is the result of a hash function modulo the size of the filter, are set to 1. If, for example, I'm using three hash functions, in order to insert word 1 in the Bloom filter, I set the following three bits, and for word 2, the following three bits. Notably, bits may be shared by multiple items. In order to look up for a word in the Bloom filter, I have to check if all the corresponding bits have been set to 1. Thus, for the negatives, this means item in the filter but lookup says it is not, are impossible because if I have inserted an element in the filter, I cannot see in one of the corresponding positions a zero. But false positives are possible because bits are shared among items. Bloom filters have been used in various applications related to DNS. These involve mapping DNSX zone names to accelerate authenticated responses, logging DNS data, detecting botnet traffic, and tracking newly observed domain names. Although all of these approaches are privacy-preserving, deletions are not supported. Thus, in this paper, we leverage on cuckoo filters instead of bloom filters, as they are more time and space efficient, 
and most importantly, contrary to Bloom filters, they support element deletion. Next, I will provide brief background on Cuckoo filters. Cuckoo filters may be perceived as two-dimensional arrays. Elements are inserted in the entries of these arrays as fingerprints. These fingerprints of size f bits are calculated using the function fgp. As two-dimensional arrays, Cuckoo filters are characterized by the number of available buckets m, the fingerprint entries b per bucket. Each element x, beware, not fingerprint, is assigned a pair of buckets h1 and h2 using the following pair of equations. Notably, it is possible to derive one bucket from the other using its index and the fingerprint of the element. This technique is known as partial key cuckoo hashing technique. An example is following for a demo cuckoo filter with four buckets and two entries per bucket. During the insertion of x, we calculate the two buckets h1 and h2 using the above equations. One of the two buckets is randomly selected to hold the fingerprint of x. We will add the x for a second time. Notably, the first bucket of the cuckoo filter is full and has no vacant entries. Next, we will insert y in the cuckoo filters. The two possible buckets for y are calculated. One of the two buckets of y is the same with one of x's buckets. Assume that we select the first bucket of the cuckoo filter to insert the fingerprint. However, the bucket is full. This will result in evicting one of x's fingerprint to x's alternate bucket and inserting y's fingerprint in this position. Lookups and deletions are performed by searching for the element's fingerprint in one of the two candidate buckets. The complexity of insertions is amortized O to 1, whilst for lookups and deletions constant O to 1. Now, let's delve deeper into our paper. In this slide, we provide a baseline description of our schema. Plaintext DNA zones are the zones that contain the resource records which are under the authoritative DNA server management responsibility. These zones may receive manual and dynamic DNS updates either by the server administrator or subscribed devices, for example, a DHCP server. Details related to the modified resource records are subsequently recorded in the zone updates log. We rely on the Privacy Aware Zone Manager, or denoted PAZM for shorter, which is responsible for constructing and maintaining the privacy preserving versions of the plaintext DNS zones. The Privacy Aware Zone Manager recovers a list on the entire plaintext resource records and has their corresponding names to create the hash DNS zones. Next, recently modified resource records, along with details pertaining to them, are retrieved from the zone updates log. Sensitive information, for example names, is hashed, and there is with data and included in an incremental DNS zone. This zone reflects recent zone changes. Recursive DNS servers that wish to filter malicious DNS requests within their premises may get the necessary zone names in a privacy aware zone format from the authoritative DNS server. This is accomplished by getting a full copy of a hash DNS zone along with its recent modifications from the corresponding incremental DNS zone. Regularly, recursive DNS servers may use the incremental DNS zone contents to update their filtering modules flexibly. As mentioned in the previous slide, the Privacy Aware Zone Manager builds and maintains the Cuckoo filters whose fingerprints are used to create and revise the contents of the Privacy Aware DNS zones. Specifically, the actions of the Privacy Aware Zone Manager include retrieving the resource records of the plaintext DNS zones, extracting their FQDNs and hashing them into fingerprints, creating the Cuckoo filters and subsequently creating the hash DNS zones. Retrieving plaintext DNS zone changes regularly from the zone updates log updating the Cuckoo filters maintained in memory and accordingly updating the incremental DNS zones. Resource records whose value was updated but the FQDN did not change are ignored. There is special treatment for resource records sharing FQDNs with others but different resource record type and or value. To that end, we use frequency counters to distinguish names introduced for the first time or finally deleted from the zones. Moreover, the Privacy Aware Zone Manager is implemented in Python 3 and utilizes the Murmur has 3 function for fingerprint and has calculation. The purpose of the has DNS zones is to hold the fully qualified domain names included in the plaintext DNS zones has and mapped in Cuckoo filters. Their contents are retrieved via XFR type DNS requests. 
In the following, we depict the information serialization format of the hashed DNA zones. Information is encapsulated within TXT type resource records. Lines 3 up to 7 are related to cuckoo filter parameters and utilized algorithms. Specifically, the hashed DNA zones provide information on the cuckoo filter total buckets, on the size of the fingerprints, and the number of possible fingerprint entries per bucket. Next, these zones provide descriptions of the algorithms used for the calculation of the fingerprints, as well as the selection of the candidate buckets for each element. Through an example, we elaborate in this slide on the method of mapping FQDNs in the hash DNA zones. In the following figure, we depict the first 82 FQDN fingerprints of our campus zone NTUA.gr mapped in a cuckoo filter. This cuckoo filter has fingerprints of size 12 bits and each bucket may accommodate up to 4 fingerprints. The rules of mapping FQDNs in the hash DNA zones are the following. 1. All fingerprints are equally sized. Each fingerprint in the hash DNA zone is represented using the ceiling value of the division between the fingerprint size F and 4 in bytes. In our example, we have a fingerprint size of 12 bits, and thus 3 bytes or hexadecimal digits are utilized for each fingerprint. This size leads to a false positive probability of 0.3%. 2. Fingerprints requiring less bytes are prepared with zeros. In our example, fingerprints requiring one or two hexadecimal digits are accordingly prepared with zeros until the size of the fingerprint representation is three bytes. Three, the fingerprints of multiple cuckoo filter buckets are mapped sequentially within a single TXT type resource record. Four, buckets with vacant entries require a trailing dot as they do not have boundaries. Full buckets do not need trailing dots. In our example, the first bucket of the TXT record includes a single fingerprint equal to the hexadecimal number C64. Thus, the first bucket includes a trailing dot, as we cannot be sure what are the boundaries of this bucket. In contrast, the second bucket is full, as it contains four fingerprints, and therefore a trailing dot is not needed. This method further conserves memory. In the above figure, the first fingerprint of each bucket is underlined for clarity. 5. The limit of, t of each TXT resource record is 255 bytes. Buckets that do not completely fit within, the, within a resource record are split and the remaining part is inserted in the next resource record. The purpose of the incremental DNA zones is to map recent name changes of the plaintext DNA zones. Their contents are retrieved via IXFR type DNS requests. In the following figure, we depict the information serialization format of the incremental DNA zones. The rules of mapping are the following. 1. The last serial parameter indicates that changes prior to this value are incorporated into the hash DNA zones. Consequently, it is the starting point for recursive DNA servers to begin retrieving data from an incremental DNA zone. 2. The sequence parameter defines if a hash DNA zone is stale and must be downloaded again. For example, this is required when the parameters of the cuckoo filter are changed because the filter is full. 3. The update section maps the fingerprints of the names that changed, the action associated with them, that is whether the name was added or deleted, and finally, the buckets in which the fingerprint is mapped in the cuckoo filter. Regarding our evaluation, we experimented with an authoritative DNS server that was a virtual machine of two vCPUs and 16GB RAM. We selected by 9 as the DNS software because it is the most common selection of DNS administrators. As our dataset, we gathered the following four zones. Our campus network, zone ntua.gr, SU zone, SC zone, and RU zone. Notably, these zones are of various sizes. All the cuckoo filter store names hast, attackers may still attempt to gain insight into zone content. This may be possible by performing brute force attacks, that is, looking up all possible character combinations to detect the stored names. The target of our first experiment is to assess the capabilities of cuckoo filters to withstand these brute force attacks in the context of TNS. In the following, we evaluate the true positives and false positives when looking up all allowed character combinations for the first label of the FQDN. We investigate first labels with length between 3 and 7 characters. The results of our evaluation are depicted in the following table. Our experiments were based on our campus network NTU8.gr zone and the false positive ratio of 
we considered 37 possible characters. These included Latin letters, digits, and a hyphen. Note that names cannot start with a hyphen. Based on the results of our experiments, we observed that FQDNs with first label longer than 5 characters are protected with high certainty as they result into a large number of false positives. Notably, as the prefix grows, brute force attacks require exponentially longer time since the total number of required hashing operations is prohibitively large. Indicatively, 100 billion operations are required in total for first label lengths of 7 characters. In the sequel, we determine the applicability of diverse data serialization formats for mapping zone names into hashed DNA zones. We consider the following serialization formats for our hashed DNA zones. The first was a cuckoo filter with multiple buckets mapped within its resource record. The second was a cuckoo filter with a single bucket mapped within its resource record. The third was a bloom filter with multiple bytes mapped within its resource record. In the following table, we depict the bandwidth consumed during an XFR request for the three mentioned data serialization formats and four considered zones of various sizes. We considered cuckoo filters with 90% field entries and a false positive probability of 0.3%. We observed that the data serialization format using a cuckoo filter with multiple buckets mapped within its resource record, this is the first option, clearly outperforms the others, including the bloom filter. The choice of using a cuckoo filter with a single bucket mapped within its resource record, this is the second option, proves inefficient as FQDN suffixes, TTL values, and type parameters included within its resource record introduce unnecessary overheat in our hashed DNA zones. In contrast, using a cuckoo filter with multiple buckets mapped within its resource record, first option, proves more efficient as it reduces the overall number of required resource records. Finally, the table also includes the actual size of the cuckoo filter, that is the bytes required to maintain the cuckoo filter in memory. This is the last column. We observe that the consumed bandwidth with our best serialization format, first option, is almost twice compared to that of the in-memory cuckoo filter. This happens because we map a fingerprint as a string in the zone files instead of an integer number in the in-memory cuckoo filter. However, the overhead is manageable for modern network links. The Privacy Aware Zone Manager performs various operations for managing the hash DNA zones. In our last experiment, we compare the latest of indicative actions using both Bloom filters and Cuckoo filters. Our results are depicted in the following chart. The considered actions include 1. The initial creation of the respective data structure in memory for both Bloom filters and Cuckoo filters by hashing and inserting all the plaintext DNA zone FQDNs. In our case, we consider the RU zone. 2. Updating the data structures by performing 1000 deletions and 1000 insertions. We observed that Bloom filters are created significantly faster than Cuckoo filters due to the element eviction process of Cuckoo filters. However, this is an action that happens once when the hash DNA zone is initially created. On the contrary, Cuckoo filters rapidly incorporate updates compared to Bloom filters, which is an important property for DNS that involves frequent updates. Unlike Cuckoo filters that directly support deletions, Bloom filters need to be rebuilt, excluding the removed data. As a conclusion, our approach proves promising for distributing authoritative DNS server zone names efficiently while preserving privacy. As a future work, we will investigate recently proposed probabilistic data structures, for example, Morton filters, XOR filters, and vacuum filters that have been reported to outperform Cuckoo filters while enabling deletions. We will employ data playing programming to protect the open channel used for relaying zone exchanges, for example, XTP. We will adapt our solution to the mitigation of the recently spotted amplification NXNS attacks, and we will develop a distributed a federated learning detection mechanism that will reduce our zone sizes by excluding infrequently requested names. At this point, my presentation is over. Interested viewers may find our open source code in the following link and may contact me at my email. Thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you, Nikos. And I forgot to introduce him, which is my mistake. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, Nikos holds a diploma in electrical and computer engineering from the National Technical University of Athens in Greece. And he is currently a third year PhD student at NTUA. His research focuses on network security tailored to the DNS. 
And with that, we have five minutes for uh, Q and A. Uh, Nikos, if you could share your video, then people can see you and also your audio. Um, and I see a question from Stuart. So Stuart, I'm going to let you in. Uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a comment more than a question. You talked about uh, encoding the data using hexadecimal and it doubles the size in bytes. I just had a quick comment for you. It's a common misunderstanding that a TXT record has to be ASCII text, and in fact, it doesn't. It's widely used containing arbitrary 8-bit values. And also, a TXT record is not limited to 255 bytes. A TXT record is one or more blocks of data, each of which is up to 255 bytes. So, Yes, um, of course, I'm aware of, sorry, uh, can, I speak? can you hear me, first of all? Uh, yes, of course, of course, I am aware of that. That you can split uh, your, uh, you, you can split uh, the TXT record into multiple strings. But I wanted to to reduce the the complexity of uh, my mapping scheme. But maybe in the future, okay. yes, we will consider cool. this mapping. I uh, think it's about uh, 64 kilobytes, if I can recall correctly. Uh, you can go up to a maximum of 64k. Uh, of course, that is you know, maybe large objects to be sending around over DNS. Uh, the other type that's commonly been used is just a null record. And a null record is an arbitrary unspecified bag of bytes with no boundaries. And of course, the third choice is to define a new DNS record type, which I know this is research right now. If it was going in for a product, uh, getting a new type would apply. But uh, if you are concerned about doubling the space requirement of hexadecimal. I just wanted to comment that that's not actually required. Thank you. I wasn't aware of uh, of this option. I will uh, I will consider it in the future, of course. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Alexander Meyerhofer. I'm giving you the mic. Thank you, everybody. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation, very interesting work. Um, thank you. I actually have one comment, which is that there is there is previous work in the field of DNS with Bloom filters, which is what we tried a couple of years ago. We tried to create a Bloom filter so that registrars could actually identify whether or not the domain name was taken um, offline, sort of, because so so as a domain name availability check. And unfortunately, there was little interest from registrars, um, but that was a very similar idea. Um, the second one is, um, are there any special considerations for wildcard records? Because I suppose that would be very hard to, 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 to add to a filter the information that there is a wildcard record in a zone that essentially creates a whole tree of existing names underneath. And first of all, about the Bloom filters, yes, of course, we are aware that Bloom filters have been used in DNS. Uh, I also included some uh, some approaches, but we we experimented with Cuckoo filters because they enable rapid updates and deletions. Uh, th uh, regarding the wildcard, uh, no, I, I think it is not supported currently by our scheme, but maybe it's uh, it's a nice step in the future. We wanted to to start with uh, the mapping of uh, of the names, but yes, more complex uh, uh, things will be uh, considered in the future, of course. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we have time for one final question. I see Alison. Oh, and she's left the queue. Alli I'm going to give you the mic, Alison. Do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. hello. Um, I'm Alison Menken. Um, and first off, I think this paper is really interesting. Second, I hope that you can, you'll can you come to the deprive, the DNS privacy session for ITF next, tomorrow because you might find some interesting overlaps with your interest there. Um, but the other question is, there's an RFC 8198 that uh, uh, has an approach to using NSEC3, a DNSSEC tool, to do something similar to, to what you've proposed. And it'd be interesting to see a comparison of that in future with your work and also maybe ways that 
your work could amplify the approach that was the the, the desire of RFC 8198. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that RFC. Um, that's my question. Did you have a chance to look at that RFC 8198 in comparison? Yes. Will yes. you come to see Pride? We'd love to see you there. Thanks of all. First of all, thank you for your detailed uh, review. Uh, yes, I have seen that the RFC, and we included it in, the, in our future work section. It is definitely one thing that we'll do on a, in a more advanced version. Uh, one good thing of our version of our uh, schema is that uh, you proactively get the zone file, and you may filter uh, as soon as possible the malicious domain names. Unfortunately, regarding the, your ITF question, I'm not uh, registered for ITF, and thus I cannot uh, I cannot attend the privacy session. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I I hope you'll get to join us sometime another time then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nikos. Thank thank you, Alison, as well. I'm going to uh, um, take away controls from both of you because we're going on to the next speaker. Um, so the next speaker is Yevenia Nozik. I hope I pronounced that correctly. She is a researcher uh, at uh, the University of uh, Grenoble Alpes in France, uh, where she works on DNS and network security from a large scale measurements point of view. Uh, and uh, Alessandro, can you start the video? Hello, everybody. My name is Evgenia Nosek from uh, University Grenoble Alp, and today I would like to present you our position paper titled Inference the Deployment of Inbound Source Address Validation Using DNS Resolvers. I would like to start this talk with IP address spoofing. Essentially, it refers to the modification of the source address of the packet, which lets the sender hide his identity. IP spoofing has been heavily used to launch distributed denial of service attacks. When sending spoofed requests to certain open services, such as DNS or NTP, the replies of a bigger size are redirected to the victim, thus bringing it down. For example, GitHub experienced a powerful DDoS attack in early 2018. They were flooded with memcached responses coming from numerous public instances. Such an attack was possible due to IP address spoofing. This problem was addressed back in 2000 when a standard called source address validation was released. The RFC suggests examining packets arriving at the network edge and dropping those with spoofed IP addresses. This can be done in two directions. Outbound filtering should drop all the packets leaving the network with the source IP not belonging there. In the inbound scenario, however, it is less obvious if the source is genuine. At the minimum, one could check that the arriving packet does not claim to be from inside the destination network. Given the number of security threats powered by IP address spoofing, we evaluate the state of deployment of source address validation at the scale of the internet. There exist several ways to check the SAV compliance, but with the emphasis on outbound filtering. Some of the methods require a vantage point inside the tested network, such as a spoofer project. Others are remote, but assume networks to be misconfigured in some ways. For example, one method relies on misconfigured DNS forwarders, while the other examines trace route loops. Finally, without even generating any additional traffic, passive detection techniques rely on BGP routing information, autonomous system relationship, and traffic engineering. In this work, we focus on inbound source address validation. There is a group of attacks, such as recently discovered an XMS attack, Microsoft cigarette, or zone poisoning, that target open services and in this case DNS. One may close its DNS servers and make them serve local clients only. However, if there is no inbound filtering, an outsider with a spoofed source address from within the range of the destination network can still misuse the DNS server. The proposed method does not require a vantage point inside tested networks. This allows us to cover the whole route of IP4 address space in a reasonable amount of time. We rely on the presence of DNS resolvers in tested networks rather than any existing misconfigurations. This figure presents our methodology. 
On the left hand side, there are two machines under our control the authoritative name server for the query domain name and the scanner. The scanner is designed to create handcrafted DNS requests. Each routable IP address receives a packet with a spot source IP address, which is always adjusting to it. So in our example, in step one, we send the request to 1.2.3.5 with the source of 1.2.3.6. If there is no inbound source address validation at the network edge or in transit and the destination is a DNS resolver, it will resolve our domain name by contacting the root, TLD, and finally our authoritative name server. The response is sent back to 1.2.3.6, which prevents us from analyzing it. However, as we capture all the traffic arriving on our authoritative name server, we know where each request is coming from. Also note that the local resolver may only be forwarding receiving the request somewhere else. To detect a true originator in case of forwarding and to prevent caching, we encode a random part and the hex IP address of each query destination in the domain name itself. The setup discussed so far shows the absence of inbound filter. However, after each spoofed query, we immediately send a non-spoofed one with the genuine IP of the scanner. If a given resolver resolves a non-spoofed query but not a spoofed one, we infer the presence of SAV at the network edge or in transit. The presented method, while having its limitations, overcomes the major challenges of existing work. We also make sure to follow ethical scanning guidelines while performing our measurements. We performed a full scan of the IPv4 routable address space in December 2019. Out of more than 5 billion A requests sent, uh, half were spoofed. We examined the queries arriving on our authoritative name server and retrieved the hex encoded IP address from the main names. In this way, we identified almost 7 million DNS resolvers most of which are closed, that initiated the resolution of spoofed A requests. These are spread across more than 32,000 autonomous systems, 197,000 BGB prefixes, and 959,000 24 IPv4 networks. Even though a couple of received requests cannot by any means define the filtering policies of entire autonomous systems, we see that almost half of those present in the BGP routing table were sources of spoofed requests. For every detected open resolver, we check whether it also resolved a spoofed query. If it did not, we assume this resolver to be from a network that deploys inbound source address validation. In general, we see that there are more networks without inbound source address validation rather than filtered ones. The interesting case is when for a single network we have at least two measurements with different outcomes. This is not uncommon and as many as 38% of autonomous systems are only partially vulnerable to inbound spoofing. But uh, why would we see networks with partial deployed source address validation? One explanation is packet losses. To test the hypothesis, we have chosen a sample of 1000 partially vulnerable slash 24 networks and rescan them. Half of them became consistently spoofing. The rest, however, were still inconsistent. We then contacted several administrators operating such networks. One claimed to be responsible only for a subset of a slash 24 and had no control of the entire network. In the other case, the network was logically divided into several parts, each of those requiring different packet filtering policies. So far, we discussed inbound source address validation. Networks must deploy it so that outsiders cannot access resources otherwise available for local clients, such as post DNS resolvers. In case of outbound source address validation, there is a problem of misaligned economic incentives. A network deploying outbound filtering cannot be an attack source, but can still be an attack target. So naturally, we assume inbound filtering to be more deployed than outbound. To 
test the hypothesis, we collected networks covered by the Spoofer project that show whether the outbound filtering is deployed. There are 559-24 networks common between our methods and the Spoofer. We see that whenever filtering is not consistent in both directions, inbound filtering is even less deployed than outbound. This clearly shows that while outbound source address validation received lots of attention in the context of DDoS attacks, inbound source address validation stayed relatively unnoticed. Today, we propose a novel method to evaluate inbound source address validation deployments at a large scale. We saw that a significant part of the internet is vulnerable to inbound spoofing. That is why we are planning a notification campaign to draw attention to the vulnerability. We made a follow-up study where we evaluated the deployment of inbound source address validation in the IPv6 address space. We found that in case of dual-stacked autonomous systems and individual hosts, it is less deployed in IPv6 than in IPv4. I invite you to check the preprint as well as the fun conference paper on the subject. The presented research was possible due to cooperation with Grenoble Alps Cybersecurity Institute. Our special thanks are also to network operators that took their time to respond to our survey. In the meantime, I invite you to visit our website and to see whether the network you are connecting from is vulnerable to inbound spoofing. I also encourage you to contact us so that we can provide you more information about your address ranges. Thank you for your attention and do not hesitate to drop us an email if you would like to know more about our research. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to let Yevhenia in. Uh, if there are questions for her, um, you can join the queue. Um, and so the queue is open. Let me share my screen as well so that we can see the program. Here we go. Um, if there are no questions from people at the moment, I, I do have a question. Um, you looked. I assume that you looked at uh, at IPv4 for mm -hmm. for this particular research, and of course, scanning on IPv6 is a little bit trickier. Did you try approaches to uncovering IPv6 addresses anyway, and then seeing if you if there, there was susceptibility to spoofing there? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so this has been done in our follow up work that I mentioned in the presentation. Uh, what we did for IPv6 is that we scanned um, an IPv6 hit list, which had around uh, 300 million entries, uh, and those are responsive IPv6 addresses uh, gathered by other researchers from different sources, uh, including DNS zone files, etc. Okay, thank you for for your answer. Um, we have about two minutes if the other people have questions, um, and just as a reminder. If you want to ask a question, let me go to the correct slide. In Meet Echo, you have to press the little microphone icon with the hand to join the queue. Okay. In the meet, uh, if you happen to have questions after the session ends, uh, you could consider joining the Slack channel on the SICOM mm -hmm. community Slack or you can send uh, Yevhenia an email. Thank you for your presentation, Yevhenia. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can go to the next uh, speaker. Um, and the next speaker is Chris uh, Shrishrak. Um, and Chris is a PhD candidate at TU Darmstadt in Germany. His research interests are broadly in applied cryptography, privacy enhancing technologies, and network security. His current focus is on cryptographic protocols and in particular practical aspects of secure multi-party computation and new applications of MPC. Uh, and Alessandro, if you could start the video. Hello, I'm Chris Rishak from TU Darmstadt. I'm going to present the work titled Limiting the Power of RPKI Authorities. This is a joint work with Haya Schulman from Fraunhofer SIT. 
resource public key infrastructure secures the interdomain routing against prefix and subprefix hijacks. However, significant part lies with the regional internet registries. In this work, we propose a distributed RPK system that relies on threshold signatures. We focus on prevention rather than detection. We ensure that any change to the RPK objects requires a joint action by a number of RIRs, which avoids unilateral IP address takedowns. Our proposal does not require any change at relying parties. So BGP is used to route packets across the world. It relies on autonomous system to make legitimate uh, route announcements and not lie that it originates a prefix that it does not own or uh, leaks routes uh, mistakenly. Uh, unfortunately, there have been many instances where routes have been leaked or hijacked. One such instance is the Russian telco uh, incident from April this year, where routes for uh, Google, AWS, and uh, Cloudflare, for instance, were sent to the Rus uh, Ross Telecom. RPKI was introduced to address this issue by authenticating root origins. RPKI is a hierarchical PKI that includes a routing certificate, root origin authorization or ROA, and a root origin validation, ROVs. So an uh, root routing certificate binds IP prefix to a public key, while an ROA binds the prefix to an autonomous system or AS. The ROA is signed by the public key associated with the RC and ROV validates the origin of BGP root announcements. And RPKI is a prerequisite for BGPSEC that provides path validation. And uh, RPKI has been deployed in two models. One is delegated and the other is hosted. In delegated RPKI, members run their own CA and member generates its own certificate, gets it signed, by the parent CA. In the hosted RPKI setting, the RIR runs the CA for the members and manages the keys and the repository. It is a convenient option for members as they do not need to run their own CAs. Even large providers such as Cloudflare use hosted RPKI. In this work, we focus on the hosted RPKI setting and focus on the issue of keys being at the RIR instead of at the members. In this setting, we particularly notice that RPKI authorities can revoke, uh, can revoke and allocate uh, resources. And RPKI authorities can unilaterally take down IP prefixes uh, based on IP, uh, law enforcement requests and ASS not and we should also note that ASS are not necessarily in the same country as the RIR. Hence, they may not have mechanisms to appeal. RIRs do not usually collude with each other and often disagree with each other when it comes to their response to law enforcement agencies. Prior works who have looked at this issue uh, have taken two particular approaches. One of them is to add transparency logs and dead objects that signify consent. And in this approach, relying parties need to take part of the burden. And uh, this approach uh, relies on detection rather than uh, prevention. And we further note that in the case of hosted RPKI, the parent manages the signing, and this means that it can sign the dead objects itself, hence defeating the purpose of dead objects. The second object, uh, second, uh, uh, proposal has been with respect uh, by using blockchain. Uh, blockchain itself has uh, issues with respect to scalability and there are also deployment issues such as consensus algorithm and the incentive for the nodes to run the blockchain. If proof of stake is used, large providers will become powerful players and it will create another form of power imbalance. Furthermore, uh, the blockchain proposal would require a complete uh, change of the existing RPK. 
Uh, in this work, we propose to use multi secure multi-party computation. So, first, what is secure multi-party computation? Uh, let's assume there are three entities which have private inputs, and one way that they can compute on this uh, private input without sending this private input to the others could be to use a trusted third party. But if there is no such trusted third party, we can use multi-party computation protocol. It is an interactive protocol where, based on the private inputs, they can compute on a function privately without leaking the private inputs to the other and uh, be assured that the output is correct. One particular instance of multi-party uh, computation is threshold signatures. In traditional signatures, uh, an entity might have a secret key which it might use to sign a message. In threshold signatures, the different entities have shares of keys instead of having the complete key and use a multi-party computation protocol to generate a signature. An important aspect here is that the signature is indistinguishable from traditional signatures, which means we can use existing verification mechanisms to verify the signature. In this work, we consider a stronger threat model than one that exists in the existing RPKI. We do not uh, we consider that individual RIAs are not entirely trusted. And in particular, we describe the adversarial model where uh, we consider passive as well as active as well adversaries. A passive adversary is one that follows the protocol but might save the protocol transcript. This uh, adversarial model is satisfactory if the key needs to be secured against internal adversaries. In the case of active uh, adversaries, uh, the adversary may act arbitrarily. Here, the operational integrity of RIAs is not assumed. Furthermore, uh, we consider uh, the number of parties which could be corrupt whether a minority of parties are corrupt or a majority of parties are corrupt. And these models will be called dissonance majority and honest majority models. And in this work, we consider four protocols, which are a combination of active and passive adversaries and uh, honest and dishonest majority protocols. Our system setup has a Two, uh, two components. So that is a trust anchor and a hosted RPKI, each with a CA and a threshold signature module. The RIR CA is the top level CA that acts as a trust anchor in the RPKI. RIR CA issues the CA certificates to its members and issues manifests and CRLs for its members. It also issues a self signed certificate for itself and a certificate for the hosted CA. The hosted CA is responsible to produce signed objects, ROA, CRL, manifest for its members. All certificates and uh, signed objects are published in public access repositories. Unlike existing RPKI, our system is interactive. That is, RIS need to interact with each other. RIS are in different continents and the communication takes place over public internet using secure and authenticated channels. At a high level, each RIR has a share of a private key for each uh, for themselves, and they use this share to collaboratively issue signed objects. None of the RIRs get to access the entire private key. So in a very high level, a member sends consent to all the RIRs, then we perform a multi-party computation protocol to generate signed objects. Then the signed objects are published in public access repositories. It's important to note that threshold signature should not be too expensive. So what we do in this work is to use threshold signature in three phases, which, it, uh, which uses two phases of pre-processing and a fast online phase. In the first uh, pre-processing phase, we use uh, member-independent pre-processing. So in this case, 
We do not require the private key shares, nor do we require the message to be available. In the second preprocessing phase, we do require the private key shares to be already generated. However, we don't need the message to be available at this point. Finally, in the online phase, when the object we signed is uh, available, we, uh, we use the signing key shares and the tuples that have been generated in the pre-processing phase to sign the message. When it comes to deployment, we consider two, uh, two kinds of deployment scenarios. The first is a two-layered scenario and then other is a flat deployment scenario. In the two layers, the two-layer scenario is compatible with existing delegated RPK setting. In the upper layer, we generate a distributed trust hacker to the five RIRs. This is performed uh, through using a distributed key generation protocol. All RIRs have the same subject public key info in their uh, trust anchor locator. Lower layer uses the threshold signature module for the hosted CAs. It generates signed objects. However, in this case, uh, we must add that this system is not entirely immune to state coercion because it still holds on to the hier hierarchical model. In the flat deployment setting, we combine the RIRCA and hosted CA. We replace the hierarchical RPKI with a flat architecture. Nevertheless, we should note that this model is not compatible with uh, delegated RPKI. We do perform evaluations of our design and uh, we perform the evaluations uh, using AWS servers and five locations where we've chosen the locations such that they are as close to existing RIR locations. Uh, in this image, you see the latency in milliseconds and bandwidth in megabits per second. So we use four multi-party computation protocols in this work. They are a combination of honest majority, honest, uh, dishonest majority, as well as passive and active uh, adversary models. So when we say honest majority, we consider that three out of the five RIRs would remain honest in the entire protocol. Uh, we run these pro and in this uh, we run these protocols on uh, both the van uh, using the five uh, five AWS servers as well as on LAN to just show the efficiency of our protocols. Uh, from the table below, you can see that the protocol that we call SEMIOT has the highest pre-processing throughput in LAN. When it comes to the WAN setting, the communication becomes more predominant than local uh, operations. We observe that the cost of active security for honest majority protocols is very small. In, uh, in these graphs, we show, uh, we use historical RPKI data to observe how many RIRs are added or removed. This allows us to gauge whether our protocols are efficient enough or not. Uh, we observe that on average, it's about 20,000 uh, signatures that we might require per month. So in the van setting, we observe that mascot, which is uh, in the dishonest majority setting and active secure, uh, produces about 0.95 signatures per second, and which roughly amounts to 82,000 signatures per day. And Shamir, uh, which is our honest majority protocol, uh, uses about 3.53 signatures per second, or uh, about 300, more than 300,000 signatures per day. So what this means is even our slowest protocol is able to satisfy the requirements on an average day. And our other protocols are able to generate enough signatures even on peak days. Uh, this of course means that when the deployment of RPKI increases, we are still able, we, we, we will still be able to uh, satisfy the requirements in terms of efficiency. So to summarize our work, uh, we propose a distributed RPKI with a stronger threat, threat model. Uh, we use threshold signatures in pre-processing model 
for efficiency. We do not require any changes at relying parties and we do note that it's a technical solution that requires legal and policy barriers to be addressed to make our work truly practical. And I can be contacted at this email address. Okay, thank you, Chris, for the presentation. I'm going to let you in so you can answer questions. Um, in the meantime, I put a reminder on the chat as well. If you would like to join the Q&A queue, you just have to push the little microphone with hand uh, icon. Um, and let me share the program again. Uh, I see a question from Tom Hill. Tom, I'm going to let you in. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Chris. It's a very, very interesting um, piece of research that you're doing. I, I think this is quite, quite cool. Um, you made a point uh, in regards to a two-layered uh, solution that was compatible with delegated RPKI and uh, multi-party computation. And you said that it was still uh, at risk of state coercion or, or still possibly capable of being coerced by a, by a single state, I presume. Um, could you expand on, on, on how you believe that to be the case? Um, so if I understood your question was, uh, why is it that in the two-layered setting that state coercion is still possible? Is that right? Uh, yes. Right. Uh, so in the two-layered setting, uh, the way you see it, you would still have the trust anchor, and which means that uh, if, for example, the hosted CA certificate is revoked, using the trust anchor and then that would essentially basically anyway anyone below in the chain can be revoked right so that was the idea there okay i will uh, i'll do some more reading with that thank you yeah okay thank you are there any other questions for chris yes i have a question from rudiger Go ahead, Rudiger, you have the mic. Uh, hi. Um, it appears to me that uh, the question of the interactions, where you are saying, well, OK, the RIRs are supposed to uh, communicate on secure channels uh, about the changes of uh, what uh, attributes and assignment uh, they are doing on the internet res uh, number resources. Um, well, okay, that uh, you are not making any uh, discussion of what security, imp uh, what security impl uh, implications uh, your system requires for the in integrity of stuff happening there. Um, and uh, kind of one should have in mind that the RPKI uh, has the goal of representing a verifiable uh, mapping of the resource allocations and uh, the related authorizations uh, of the number uh, uh, of the number resources. And uh, if the system for uh, managing that uh, has has problems, uh, well, having a very secure uh, system uh, uh, of uh, mapping that underlying domain, uh, well, okay, uh, actually that security is uh, kind of not really out. Are you, did you stop uh, asking Rüdiger or, or did the audio cut out? Yes. OK. Uh, Chris, was the question clear to you? Uh, I think I missed the question. I got the initial part of the comments, but I think the question got lost somewhere. 
Rilke, could Welcome. you just repeat the question you had? Um, uh, you are you are uh, uh, fiddling with the security of the RP uh, of the RPKI, the crypt a cryptographic system. The RPKI is actually supposed to provide a mapping of a resource management system done uh, handled by the RIRs. Um, and uh, uh, you are only looking at uh, the security aspects of the cryptographic system and uh, 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 saying uh, the management of the underlying resource system uh, will be will be pushed into uh, a secure communication system between the RIRs um, and uh, the uh, security questions for exactly that management seem not to be covered by your fiddling with the cryptographic system. Okay. Chris, would it be fair? Would it be fair to say that that is something that you might address in future work? Yeah. So, so I mean, part of the reason we didn't uh, describe that in this paper also is uh, we basically had only six pages. But yes, uh, that's a good point, and uh, we actually do address that uh, in the upcoming full version. So, yeah, that will be covered. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay. Perfect. Riddiker, thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, um, I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to end the Q&A because otherwise we run out of time. Chris, thank you for your presentation and for answering questions. If anybody has questions for Chris later on, you can always email him. Um, right, so that means we are going to our fourth speaker of this session, uh, which is by Stephen Strauss from the RIPE NCC. Uh, Stephen is a senior researcher in the R&D team at the RIPE NCC. He's interested in network protocol behavior and IPv6 deployment. Prior to working at the RIPE NTC, he ran the IPv6 program at Yahoo, and he worked on traffic monitoring agents at Boundary. He holds a PhD degree in network routing scalability from the University of Glasgow. Um, Alessandro, can you start the video? Withdrawal symptoms and the filtering of announcements from a route collector system is a short position paper looking at a particular operational quirk of the data collected by the RIPE Routing Information Service, i.e. RIS. The context for us paying attention to this was that back in January, we were studying the deboganization of 2A10-12. That, for context, is the first slash 12 that's been issued from the IANA to any of the registries in many years, and we were in a position where we wanted to start issuing it to membership. In order to do that cleanly, we wanted to make sure that the space was usable, that there were no particular threats or hotspots in the space. And so we ran a study to deboganize this and to collect the traffic that was arriving in that space. We have written about this extensively and you can go dig out our TMA paper or the video version where you can continue listening to me talking about this particular study. The short version of this is that we announced nine prefixes into BGP, and those were all configured slightly differently. We had four slash 32s, we had four slash 48s. Each of those had a responsive pingable address, so we were running RIPE Atlas measurements into that space to test active reachability. Each of the prefixes were configured slightly differently in terms of whether they had an entry in the routing database or if they had an RPKI rollout. In addition, we announced the slash 12 with neither of these as the covering prefix for the entire space. We announced these from RRC03. In addition to those nine prefixes, there are stable anchors and predictable beacons that originate from RRC03. There is a page which describes the beacons and anchors for the entire fleet, but the prefixes that we care about are the two prefixes that are listed there. One core aspect of the larger study was that we wanted to understand if we announce the new prefixes, how far would they apparently propagate across BGP? 
One of the simplest ways that we had to achieve that is to simply count the number of RISP peers across the entire fleet that observe the prefixes when they are announced as a very simple metric for whether the prefixes are being filtered or not. So given that this is new address space, it is difficult to arrive at a preconceived notion of precisely how many peers is the correct number of peers that should see the space. Although what we would anticipate is that most of the peers should see the space in order for us to be happy that it was reasonable for members to use. This was in the paper correlated with RIPE Atlas measurements that show pretty good visibility across the board. The key part that leads us onto this short paper for ANRW is that on withdrawal, we observe a spike at the end right here. So we spend a little bit more time looking at what actually happens in those few moments at withdrawal that exposes additional peers to the route collector system. I'm going to quickly cover a mental model for how the route collector system actually works and what people may expect to fall out of that. In this example, we have RRC03, which exists inside ASN12654 on the left hand side. That is accurate according to the experiment that we ran earlier in the year. And on the right hand side, we have an arbitrarily selected peer number one, which exists within AS64501, which is not a real ASN. And there may be a BGP session set up between these two peers so that they can exchange BGP routing information. And peer one may itself have peering sessions set up with its own peers. Now, RRC03 has address space that it wants to announce to the network. And in this case, in this toy example, it's 28104-32. And it will announce that using its existing BGP session with peer number one. And having received that information, peer number one can then make its own decision on what to do with that and who to propagate that announcement to. And in this case, it's decided to announce that to peers number two and three and back to RRC03. The crux of some of our observations in this study is that not everything gets back propagated to the place that it originated from. And this is a key thing where people tend to think of the route collectors as being listeners only. But in this case, there's a key difference. The route collector is announcing some space. The distinction is that in the peering policy that we set up for people who choose to peer with race, we request that those peers announce all of their IPv4 and IPv6 BGP routes back to the RRC. So there is a reasonable expectation that having announced something out into BGP, that that information existing in the peering BGP speaker would then be back propagated to the route collector. What we see is that this is not always the case. So let's cover some of the observations that we make prior to withdrawal and immediately after withdrawal. Throughout the whole study, we observe only three AS paths for the nine test prefixes drawn from 2A10 slash 12 that are of length 2. That is, they originated at AS12654 for RIS, and they were returned to any route collector via any peer. Two of those AS paths are collected at RRC03 itself via the two ASNs listed in the slide. And this scenario is super simple. RRC03 announces one of the prefixes out to one of its peers, and that peer announces the prefix back to RRC03. That is in line with what might be a reasonable expectation for how the REST system would work. We observe only one other two-hot path, and that's via AS8218, which propagates the announcements to six route collectors, but not back to RRC03 itself. And that scenario can look a little bit more like this, where RRC3 announces one of the prefixes to one of its peers, and that announcement propagates within that peer network and out via another BGP session in another location to another route collector, but not back on the initial path back to RRC03. 
Immediately following the withdrawal message, we observe 17 additional peers across the fleet of row collectors. That is the contributor to the spike in the graph that I showed earlier. Eight of those peers are observed at RC03 itself. Now, the withdrawal message naturally triggers the path hunting phase, where the BGP system is going to iteratively try and select the best remaining path after increasingly shorter paths have been removed until there are none left. It's in this phase that RRC03 observes the announcements for peers that were previously not seen. And given that those peers are not filtering the announcements, they're simply not propagating the announcements back along the link that they were originally received. This picture looks a little bit more like this. If RRC03 had a peering session set up with peers 1 and 3, and the announcement goes out via peer 1, peer 1 decides to propagate to peer 3, and peer 3 decides to propagate back to route collector 3, then we wind up with a 3-hop path. And equally, the reverse path might be visible in the data also. Now this is a default behaviour on certain vendor hardware, that the router will not propagate an announcement back along the link on which it was originally received. That's a reasonable efficiency gain. The missing information on RIS is that we don't necessarily know the vendor hardware that's running on the other side of any of these sessions or how they are configured. And so there is missing information for researchers who are looking at this data and trying to interpret this data. And in particular, perhaps there is an expectation gap between what the route collector system is showing for address space announced elsewhere versus the address space that is announced from the route collector system itself. In conclusion then, the purpose of writing some of this stuff down is that BGP operations are complex and full of implicit details, and this is just one of those details. This is, in a sense, an operational quirk of the route collector system, but many people in the community use this data and the beacons and anchors that are announced from the route collectors themselves to perform analyses of how the internet system is operating today. So if you are using these announcements from any of the RRCs, it may be that that RRC simply offers a poor view of its visibility. It's a good thing to be aware of. Further, the announcement of completely fresh address space that had never been used before may be insightful for routing researchers. And all of the data that we have is publicly available to everybody in the community out there, be it in RIS, but also in other data sets such as reviews. And on that, I'm super happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. I should have let you into the video, although I'm not, ah, there you go, you're also visible now. Um, can you say something because I don't think I have audio for you. Exactly, you need to ask for audio as well, <laughs> separately. Um, if there are any people that have, yes, Ah, good, there you are. If there are any people that have questions, you can join the uh, Q&A queue. Um, I think I have, I have a question. So the, the, the request that you do as right for the, for the route collectors is that people reflect the route back to you. To what extent are you actively, is RIPE actively chasing down this particular request? And are, are you going out to, to peers to ask them to do this? Or is this sort of um, something that you ask for, but then leave up to them, entirely up to them? Uh, the, the short answer is that we're not pursuing especially aggressively at all. Um, but I mean, if we heard some consensus that people are, um, people have these expectations from RIS, um, then I think that we could put a bigger effort into chasing if we felt like it was a reasonable thing to do. Um, the, the, this, the purpose of writing some of this down is a little bit of information sharing just to make people aware. And if uh, people are willing to tweak their filtering policies, then that would be awesome. That's, that's the level that we're at right now. Right. I have two people in the queue. I have a question from Rudiger and from Moritz. I'm gonna give the floor to Rudiger first. Rudiger, go ahead, ask your question. Oh, and he's gone. Oh, and it's for Moritz. Moritz, go ahead. Well, uh, oh, oh, Rudiger is back. Uh, okay. It, it you go seems first. to me that you are uh, uh, actually hitting the uh, features that are uh, in BGP to protect against routing loops. 
And uh, uh, yes, it is vendor dependent uh, in which of the implicit uh, default policies uh, routes are pruned to protect against uh, uh, routing loops. Um, but, uh, uh, well, okay, uh, uh, kind of, uh, in fact, uh, you would expect that uh, standard policies do not announce uh, routes that have the uh, peers AS in the, uh, in the AS path. That's it. Um, fair point. Um, and actually, like there, there is a little bit of information hunting from us in terms of what these, uh, what the different impl implementations are doing. Some BGP speakers will simply take the announcements and send it back down the path that it came from, and some vendors will definitely not do that in the default. And my guess is that in many cases, our peers are not deviating far from default configurations. And I suspect that that is the most common behavior that we're seeing rather than um, AS path loop prevention. But maybe I'm wrong. There could be, uh, there could be the AS path loop prevention also. But good point. Like the, the part of this is we don't always know what's happening on the other side of the BGP session, for sure. OK, we have uh, another question from Moritz. Moritz, you have the mic. Go ahead. You looked at previous work that's uh, made use of these rock collectors and whether your results affect their results. No, but that is a great question. Um, the, the anchors and the beacons are put out there um, for people to use. And I'm personally not up to speed on precisely who's been using this recently, but that would be, that would be a valuable thing to go and do um, in case there are legitimate concerns with those results. For sure. Sounds like a very nice reproducibility paper uh, that uh, people can write. Yes. OK. Um, are there any other questions from people that are in the room? If not, then thank you, Stephen. And we can go to our final speaker of this uh, session. Um, our final speaker uh, is uh, Xiao Xiang. Uh, Xiao is an associate research scientist in the Department of Computer Science at Yale University. His research interests include software-defined networking, resource discovery and orchestration in collaborative data sciences, interdomain routing, and wireless cyber-physical systems. From 2014 to 2015, he was a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Computer Science at McGill University. He received his master and PhD degrees in respectively uh, uh, sorry, in computer science at Wayne State University in 2012 and 2014, and a bachelor degree in information technology security and a bachelor degree in economics from Nankai University in 2007. Alessandro, can you start the video? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chao. It is my great pleasure to present our work toward programmable interdomain routing to ARW 2020. This works in collaboration with Jensen, Frank, and Richard. As we all know, interdomain routing determines routes from source destination pairs that span multiple autonomous systems. Ideally, the interdomain routing protocol should allow policy routing and flexible supports flexible traffic engineering and other use cases. The de facto interdomain routing protocol is the border gateway protocol, BGP. In a nutshell, in BGP, each AS makes and executes its own policy to select routes and export the selected routes in terms of path vectors to its neighbor ASs. BGP is flexible for ASs to impl implement its own policy routing, but it has a limited capability of supporting other use cases, such as flexible traffic engineering. The, its fundamental limitation is that BGP lacks mechanism for flexible end-to-end -end interdomain route control. For example, in this topology, there are shorter ASS passes in the network, but ASS cannot select, select them. This is because BGP does not provide mechanism for us to control its route selection. And the goal of this paper 
is to give a systematic formulation of software-defined inter-networking SDN model to extend interdomain SDN to generic interdomain SDN to support flexible end-to-end -end interdomain root control. With this model, conceptually, we are able to program and control every single packet end-to-end -end in an interdomain network. And it also saves users from the trouble of configuring and reasoning low-level details of interdomain routing, such as AS pass prepending, offline negotiations, and tunnel management. We begin with the introduction of the SDN network control, network control model. In our control model, we are motivated by the recent success of single domain SDN and we aim to achieve similar things in the interdomain setting. In particular, we abstract each AS as a virtual switch with a pipeline of match action tables and pass ports, aka AS pass, and expose such information through a northbound protocol such as our application layer traffic and traffic organization protocol out of. With this abstraction, a client connects to SDNS to control paths in the interdomain network, and a client may also select to control a sub only a subset of SDNS to simplify management and business arrangements. The key difference between SDN and SDI is that the upstream passport in SDI must depend on downstream passports. For example, in the same topology, if ASE is instructed to select EFD, and but ASE has its own uh, export policy to not export EFD to B, then A's passport would only have AC EFD instead of two AS passes. As such, in the path selection at SDNS must be consistent. So when a client selects a different passport at downstream, passport at upstream may change, causing churns and disruption if the paths are not selected consistently. To, uh, to address this issue, we give a user three-layer three design of SDNS and the two-phase commit path selection process. In particular, in addition to the common data plane layer and control plane layer, we introduce another shadow control plane layer on top of it where in the first phase, a user can select paths and test consistency in, shadows in, in the shadow control plane layer using the interim routing protocol. And after a, a consistent path are found by the user, a user can commit this consistent path selection through the control plane of SDNS all the way to the data plane. After introducing the control model of SDN, we further uh, discuss how client can achieve optimal, optimal control in SDN. In particular, we consider the scenario where a client connects to KSDNS and wants to select the consistent path of M source density flows, and a client object, objective is defined by utility function C over all these M flows. And with these settings, we formulated the problem as uh, the optimization problem uh, to maximize a client's utility subject to the routes selected in all KSDNS must, must be consistent. We proved the, that this problem is MPHI hard through a reduction from scarcity problem. And to, uh, to tackle this problem, we reformulated this problem as a black box optimization model. In particular, we lift the path consistency constrained from the constraint of this problem to the object objective function of this problem by introducing binary variable to indicate the path consistency of different paths. And with this reformulation, we are able to leverage a black box, black box optimization framework which use the primary belief to direct the search of con optimal consistent paths and use the posteriors of the consistent test result to update the belief. To further down to if it, to further narrow down the search space, and to tackle with the combinatorial discrete search space in the client SDI control optimization problem, and we further introduce two mechanisms to Im further improve the search efficiency. First, we leverage the fact that one inconsistent path found in a, in a search can help prove a large search space in the future search. The second, we leverage the fact that one consistent path can help avoid many repeated tests in the future research. With these two mechanisms introduced, we 
developed a very efficient black box optimization pro algorithm to help users fastly, fast, fastly find the optimal, optimal consistent SDI pass in the SDI model. We evaluate our uh, SDI framework and the uh, co control optimization algorithm using uh, using Kaida Internet Polity data with over 60,000 ASCs and uh, 320,000 AS level links. And we considered AS actual policies as a, combina a combination of the typical customer provider relationship and certain also with a certain part of blacklisting ASCs and forbidden segments in the network. And we, in our evaluation, we set the client objective to find the shortest AS path for the top 2,000 AS pairs in terms of traffic volumes based on the Kaida Internet traffic dataset. And our key finding is that in all our experiments, the SDI optimization algorithm can find an optimal policy compliant shortest AS path. And in over in 95% of the case, this can be found by sampling no more than 35 passes until we find the optimal consistent pass in the network. After demonstrating the benefits and feasibility of SDI, we further conducted a private study of SDI of, 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 of SDI model. In particular, the driving question for us is well, can BGP policies be inferred from the exposed ribs and selected route exposed in the SDM, in SDM net attraction? The typical perception is that BGP is usually good at hiding policies, and BGP looking glasses and auto server has already been deployed to expose such information. However, our preliminary finding is that BGP selection policy can be inferred by solving a typical classification problem. And in particular, in our simulation, we, we considered one AS to expose its rib and select it out. And this AS is connected to a varying number from 3 to 20 neighbor ASCs. And it implements next hop based local preference assignment and follow the standard root selection procedure of BGP. And we considered a small number of samples, a rib select out samples from 200 to a, lar a fairly large one, 20,000 uh, 20, samples per data set. And in our result, we found that when the number of neighbor ASCs is small, for example, less than eight ASCs, only using only 160 samples in a simple feed-forward neural networks with 30 neurons would provide a minimum of 95% accuracy of inferring the correct BGP selection policy. So to conclude, uh, in this short talk, we propose a simple, novel, software-defined interdomain networking SDN model extending interdomain SDN to generic interdomain SDN. We design an efficient organization problem algorithm to solve the client SDI control organization problem. We demonstrate the feasibility, benefits, and potential privacy concern of the SDI using evaluation results. Our future work include how to extend from coarse green destination IP-based SDI to fine green TCP IP, IP five tuple based SDI, and also accurate BGP policy inference with few short learn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xiao. Uh, I have let you uh, in for the audio and video so you can answer uh, questions. Sure, thanks for that. Um, are there any questions that people for have for Xiao, we have a few minutes for Q&A before the session ends. Um, while people are thinking about questions, I'm just going to share the program for the rest of the workshop. There we go. And I would also like to remind everyone that if you if you don't have any questions now, but you have them later on, you can contact all of our speakers uh, because their papers are online on the ANRW website. Um, and I think that at the moment there aren't any Questions. Xiao, will you be around in the other sessions? Because if you're on the chat, people can still ask you questions later on. Yeah, I'll I'll try to be around in your uh, in your few uh, the other sessions. Yes. 
Excellent. And are you by any chance also on the SICOM Slack channel? Uh, yes, I am. On, actually, I am on the SICOM uh, Slack channel, but uh, um, is that the, the SICOM workspace, a uh, Slack workspace? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I am. Yes. Um, yeah, people Perfect. can just uh, find, find me. Yes. Yeah, and this is maybe also a reminder to uh, all of our uh, uh, participants that you can join the SICOM Slack channel if you have questions later on. Um, there are currently 30 people uh, on, uh, in the SICOM Slack channel, and I see 120 participants, so there is room for more people there. Um, I think uh, we, are, uh, we are out of time almost. Thank you for, uh, for your presentation, Chow, and also thank you for, uh, for your video. Um, I'm going to uh, close the session soon. Um, this is a reminder that the workshop can, has uh, three more sessions coming up. We have uh, session two on protocol testing and validation coming up at one o'clock UTC. Uh, so that's in about 25 minutes from now. Uh, and then uh, the last session today will be at 10 past two uh, UTC on transport protocols and traffic engineering. Uh, and that is in about an hour and uh, 35 minutes from now. And tomorrow we have another session on monitoring and logging, which will start at uh, uh, one o'clock UTC in the um, afternoon. Um, I'm going to have one more quick look at the chat because it looks like people are asking questions. Uh, you're welcome, Jim. Uh, and we are happy. And I would also like to thank everybody for attending. And I hope to see you in about 25 minutes in the next session. Uh, this session will automatically close 10 minutes, uh, five or 10 minutes after uh, the official end time, which is in four minutes from now. Thank you for attending. <laughs>